Okay. You're rolling. Oh, okay. Come now and listen to our tale of woe of Juliet and Romeo. Right out of Shakespeare, it's something you know of Juliet and Romeo. Near was a story so mournful as that one. If you've a tear, now prepare to get at one. Romeo's the thin one and Juliet's the fat one. Oh, Romeo, oh, Juliet. Why did I start my talk by inflicting that on you? <laughs> it's a song I remember from childhood, before I had ever read the play or seen it on stage or in a movie, and I'm using it now to make a couple of points. One, Romeo and Juliet are so well known as archetypes that even children in the 1950s could sing about them. Right out of Shakespeare, it's something you know. <laughs> and then two, burlesques or parodies of Shakespeare go all the way back to the 17th century. And there was an explosion of them in the Victorian era. This little ditty seems to trace back to the 1920s. A work can be parody only if it is widely familiar. That is, if everyone has the same reference points. We all know Shakespeare's play, at least by reputation, as a tragic love story of young lives wasted by a culture of violence. And human nature cries out for balance. In a play, tragedy is often tempered by comedy, either to heighten the tragedy or to give some perspective on it. So there's a natural impulse to retreat away from the tragic into humor just as Juliet does when she thinks the nurse has reported Romeo dead. In lines that are often cut, she puns on I and I and I. Hath Romeo slain himself? Say thou but I, and that bare vowel I shall poison more than the death-darting eye of cockatrice. Point number three about why I began with that parody song. What better way to look at the poetry in the play than by setting off Shakespeare's sublime language with some lowbrow doggerel. My talk is titled Romeo and Juliet's Poetry in Action. Yes, the poetry in this play is integral to the action. In Shakespeare's day, audiences spoke not of going to see a play, but going to hear a play. Perhaps my few examples will help you listen for some poetic uses of language that will enhance the experience for you. The play begins with a perfect Shakespearean sonnet, three quatrains and a concluding couplet, spoken by the chorus in this production by the actor with authoritative voice, who also plays Prince Aeschylus. He tells us in 14 lines exactly what is going to happen. The first quatrain of that sonnet sets the scene. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. The second and third quatrains tell us that within this two hours traffic of our stage, a pair of star-crossed lovers will die. Their deaths will bury their parents' strife. In those 14 lines, three words occur twice, death, love and lover, and civil. The repeated word civil reminds us that the entire community bears responsibility for the rampant violence in public places. The chorus speaks another Shakespearean sonnet, that is another three quatrains and a couplet, at the top of Act Two. This one zeroes in on the newfound love of Juliet and Romeo, with its opposition of desire and death, love and foe, this sonnet alerts you to listen for contradictions throughout the play. Capulet versus Montague, young versus old, day versus night, love versus hate, light versus heavy, fast versus slow. 
In fact, Romeo goes crazy with oxymorons in his very first scene when he thinks he is in love with Rosalind. Oh, loving hate. Oh, heavy lightness, cold fire, sick health, and so on. When Juliet learns Romeo's name at the Capulet Ball, she exclaims, my only love sprung from my only hate. Later, when she anticipates Romeo coming to her chamber after dark, she says, come thou day in night. And when she learns that Romeo has killed Tybalt, she calls Romeo a beautiful tyrant, fiend, angelical, dove-feathered raven, wolfish, ravening lamb. If you listen for them, you will hear endless additional examples of contrasting imagery throughout the play. You will hear opposite extremes in the broad use of language, the vulgarity of guys in the streets during these hot days with the mad blood stirring, versus the lyricism of the lovers in the moonlight of the balcony scene. You will notice also that we often go inside the Capulet house and get intimate glimpses of their family dynamics, whereas the Montagues are known to us only as they appear in public places. The chorus even tells us that although Romeo can roam about town as he pleases, Juliet has means much less to meet her new beloved anywhere. She is trapped in the house unless she gets permission to go to confession at Friar Lawrence's cell. Friar Lawrence himself is a study in contradictions. He's an ordained priest who dabbles in mystical potions and seems to fancy himself a Dear Abby or a Sigmund Freud while he botches his clandestine attempt to help the young couple. Listen to the oppositions in some couplets from Friar Lawrence's herb-gathering monologue in Act Two. For naught so vile on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give. For aught so good, but strained from that fair youth, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice being misapplied, and vice sometimes by action dignified. Well, with that set up, and since I have not been able to work in very much in the way of jokes and anecdotes, <laughs> let me ask you, why should you never buy flowers from a monk? Answer. Because only you can prevent florist friars. <laughs> Let's go back to Act One for the most famous of the play's three sonnets. This one is embedded in the text of the Capulet's Masquerade Ball. Before we get to that sonnet, Romeo spots Juliet across a crowded room. At first sight, it is her beauty that inspires his poetic rapture. Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night like some rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. So shows a snowy dove trooping with crows as yon fair lady o'er her fellows shows. The measure done, I'll watch her place of stand, and touching hers, make blessed my rude hand. Did my heart love till now? Forswear it sight, for I ne'er saw true beauty till this night. When Romeo manages to get close to Juliet and speaks the first quatrain of a sonnet to her, she is able to respond with a full quatrain that both picks up on his imagery and displays her own quick wit. This makes it clear that there's something more than external beauty for him to love. 
The Capulet Ball sonnet, sonnet is innovative in that it breaks down into dialogue. It's an amazing tour de force of theater and poetry. The two sonnets spoken by the chorus are narrative summaries of action, but the Capulet Ball sonnet is action itself. In only 14 lines, Romeo and Juliet speak to each other for the very first time and fall so completely in love that there is no turning back for either of them. After each one has spoken a quatrain, they launch into Stichomythia, exchanges of mostly single lines for the final quatrain and couplet, completing each other's rhymes. Stichomythia gives the effect of increasing intensity. What better indication that these two are soulmates? The key words are hands, lips, and kiss. But notice what else is going on in the sonnet. Romeo uses metaphor when he speaks of her hand as a holy shrine, while his hand is an unworthy pilgrim drawn to the shrine. The vocabulary is religious. Shrine, pilgrim, devotion, saint, holy, prayer, faith. It leads them to a kiss as a sublimation of exalted feelings. Now, while Romeo and Juliet are utterly sincere, the technique of using religious vocabulary to express earthly love might call to mind for some of us a perverted example from 70 or so years later. Kansas City has been celebrating the 400th birthday of the 17th century French comic playwright Moliere. He wrote an ever popular and funny play in verse about hypocrisy titled Tartuffe. In a famous speech, Tartuffe uses religious words like heaven, devotion, salvation, and bliss as doublon tons in his attempt to seduce Elmire. It is fiendishly clever, but Shakespeare is sublime. So let's zero in on the famous sonnet. Will the two of you who agreed to read for us now come up to the microphone? We have with us tonight Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints of hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Have not saints lips and holy palmers too? I pilgrim lips that they must use in prayer. Oh then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray. Grant thou let lest faith, lest faith turn to despair. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Then move not, while my prayer's effect I take. And he kisses her at the end. <laughs> Shakespeare's standard verse line is iambic pentameter. Five iams, that is da -dum, uh, per line, and that is five feet and each foot comprising an unstressed and a stressed syllable. For example, um, here's the opening of Mercutio's tour de force speech. Oh then, I see Queen Mab hath been with you. Okay, five feet, but each one had two syllables, one unstressed and stressed. The whole speech is like that. Since almost all of the play's dialogue is spoken in iambic pentameter, the occasional shifts into prose create a meaningful contrast. The short list of prose sequences begins in the opening scene with the shouts and tumult of the crowd in the street brawl. Servants, including the illiterate servant with invitations to the Capulet Ball, speak prose. The surprise is that in Act Two, Scene Five, there are well-born characters who switch from their earlier verse into prose. 
It's as if Benvolio and Mercutio find it just too much effort to be poetic in the heat of the July noonday sun in the streets. Even Romeo speaks prose when he joins them, and the nurse, who normally uses iambic pentameter with Juliet and her mother, now also speaks prose to the guys in the street. But when Romeo and the nurse step aside to speak privately about Juliet, they easily segue back to poetry. In fact, the beauty of Romeo and Juliet's poetic sequences is all the more lovely by contrast with the extreme raunchiness of other sequences. The servants in the opening scene, the male friends Romeo hangs out with, and even Juliet's nurse all employ shocking vulgarity in their language. The guys, of course, supplement their body language with vulgar gestures. Another way language reveals character is by vocabulary choices. For example, Tybalt uses the word hate twice in his very first four lines. Talk of peace. I hate the word, as I hate hell, the Montagues, and thee. The word love is not heard in dialogue until Romeo appears, 160 lines into the play. But after that, the word gains weight with many repetitions. Repetition is a powerful poetic device that Shakespeare uses skillfully. Besides the examples I've mentioned, the most notable repeated word in the play is light, a word that occurs far more often in Romeo and Juliet than in any other Shakespeare play. The light dark and day night imagery begins in the very opening scenes dialogue between Romeo's father, Lord Montague, and Benvolio. Montague says, away from light, steals home my heavy son. Montague expresses concern that Romeo then shuts himself up in a darkened room. We soon figure out that Romeo is heavy, leaden, slow moving, and weepy, as long as he thinks he is in love with Rosalind. His love for Juliet, however, makes him light of weight and light in spirit. He tells her that he scaled the Capulet orchard walls with love's light wings. But most of the light imagery is associated with Juliet herself. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Um, notice the use of metaphor. Juliet is the sun. It ties her to the imagery of day and light. In Act 5, when Romeo enters the tomb, he says, For here lies Juliet, and her beauty makes this vault, vault a feasting presence full of light. Other standard poetic devices, besides repetition, can be found throughout the play. Alliteration. I'll look to like if looking, liking, move. Fain would I dwell upon thy form, Fain, fain deny what I have spoke, but farewell, compliment. My blood for your rude brawls doth lie a bleeding. And there's consonance. My reputation stained with Tybalt's slander. Unseemly woman in a seeming man and ill-beseeming beast in seeming both, thou hast amazed me. <laughs> For nothing can be ill if Juliet be well. Death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath. <laughs> There's assonance. Sleep dwell upon thine eyes. Peace in thy breast. Would I were sleep and peace so sweet to rest. As soon moved to be moody. Is it more sin to wish me thus so forsworn? And finally, what is perhaps the most powerful of all the devices in poetry's toolbox, rhyme. Most of the play is in blank verse, but the final lines 
cap things off with rhymed couplets. The prince says, a glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show its head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned and some punished. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. I've been very good this year. I usually go way too long, uh, but <laughs> this time I have, I have, we have 10 minutes if there are any questions. <laughs> yes. We usually hear actors perform it in the receipt pronunciation day, but does it really change if you go to the Globe Theater in London and hear it in the, ori uh, the original pronunciation, that 400-year-old dialect? That. Of course, I very much exaggerate it. It's not going to sound like that when good actors say it. Um, but at the Globe, I think what they say is the main difference between British and American actors, besides British accent, or, um, is that uh, British play Shakespeare much faster. I've forgotten the statistics on how many lines per minute the British do, but it's quite several lines more than Americans get into a minute. <laughs> Does that answer your question? It's close. Anyone else? <laughs> yes? It, it occurs to me for the first time that given that Romeo and Juliet were supposed to be teenagers, is that correct? Yes. They're extremely well educated, just that Juliet would have had such a good life. Is that true? I mean, we know that Juliet's going to turn 14 in a couple of weeks, and it's awfully young. Oh, I'm sorry. Please repeat the question. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Get it right. <laughs> um, the question is about uh, Romeo and Juliet's young age, and, and does it seem right that they are as well educated as they seem to be at only 13 and 14? Um, <laughs> Especially Juliet being so Yes, especially, yes, with Juliet. Um, but if, of course, in a well-to-do family, as the Capulets are, uh, they, she certainly must have had tutors. Uh, women were expected to learn embroidery, music, conversation, but uh, a, a quick-witted girl with a, with a good mind or interested in learning uh, could pick up a lot of things from. And she's the only child, so she doesn't have a brother to learn from. Um, well, it's a good question. How does she learn? <laughs> Uh, we don't see any evidence of history or literature, but she has a, just an educated quality. Uh, so um, that would be true in the Italian Renaissance that Shakespeare is writing about, and it's based on an Italian Renaissance work that was translated into French and then English. Um, but it would also be true in Elizabethan England, except that 14 was a very young age for marriage, even in aristocratic people. Uh, for others, um, marriage in Elizabethan times was often not until the late 20s because they couldn't afford to get married. Uh, there weren't that many places to live. Um, so yes, 14 is a very young age for, for marriage um, among Elizabethans, even among aristocrats. Um, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I know you don't want to get into this, but in the Shakespeare authorship question, um, the if, if you know that the plays were not written by the guy from Stratford, but actually written by Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, um, he was married to uh, a young woman of uh, 14, not of his choice, um, but it was a, an arranged marriage. Yes? I heard reading about Christopher Marlowe. He, he, he had a sister who was 12, and she got married at the age of 12. Uh, who is this? Uh, Christopher Marlowe's sister. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I didn't know that. It's very interesting. I'll that. <laughs> <laughs> He's telling us that Christopher Marlowe had a sister who was married at 12. Now, uh, uh, of course, there's also some confusion between betrothal and marriage. A betrothal was as binding as a marriage, and uh, that could take place, um, you know, years before the marriage did. So it's, we, we don't always know. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what was going on there. <laughs>
but thanks for mentioning that. Yes. When you go to Verona in Italy, you learn that the actual families the story is based on are the Capuletti and the Montecchi. But Shakespeare calls them the, the Capulets and the Montagues in this. And Montague, it's, it's spelled differently, he's the same name as a British noble family. Well, do you think he was eyeing patrons by naming one of his noble families after a British, not an Italian noble family? <laughs> Well, it, that, there's, there's, that's definitely a possibility to speculate about. Uh, but he, he stayed, in, in terms of the names, he stayed fairly close to his sources. And the, the immediate source was a narrative poem uh, written by someone called Arthur Brook, which I think was a pseudonym for Edward de Vere himself uh, as a teenager studying with his tutor. Um, <laughs> So, and, and Brooke, you know, Oxford and Mr. Ford and Merry Wives of Windsor, I mean, all kinds of uh, mixed up clues like that. Um, so, um, it's, uh, I've, I've lost my train of thought there, but <laughs> um, I, the names say, stay pretty close to the um, English version of the story, Romeo and Juliet, in the narrative poem which in turn comes from the Italian by Bandello. And in, there's also a French version mixed in there too. <laughs> yes? Do you know what the average like age for marriage was at that time? No, um, the question is the average age for marriage in Elizabethan England, I guess. Uh, so that was part of the mindset, although uh, De Vere did travel in Italy and saw though, that lifestyle as well. Um, but it, it a lot depends on social class, because uh, as I said, the um, working people and even what we would call shopkeepers, so on, um, married late. Uh, but aristocrats had the freedom of at least, certainly betrothal and often marriage uh, much earlier. The, I guess to answer your question, no, I don't know the average age. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. When, when I was reading about. Elizabethan South England. They, they said the average age was late teens and early 20s. Okay, that sounds, that sounds about what I would It also makes sense speculate. in other ways, because you know, the people then tended to be smaller than people today. And if, if a girl got married, say, at 12, it could be fatal. Yes, yes, childbirth could be fatal at age 12. Yeah. And, and Lady Montague married, she said she married at 12 and had only the one child. Surviving child. Historically, um, girls married older men, or uh, the husband was historically older than the wife. Um, now that seems to be changing. We're seeing a lot of older women marrying younger men. Any other questions? Well, what a wonderful audience. Of, <laughs> I wish I'd started later, uh, but <laughs> so that I would have had you all at the beginning, but thank you all for coming. <laughs> thank you.